Homage to the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. Today, let's look at the Parambhava Sutta, and this is in Sutta Nipata, Chapter 1, Discourse Number 6. This is where the Devas come to Jetha's grove to ask the Buddha about what brings a person's downfall. This is linked to the Mahamangala Sutta. That was where the Devas asked the Buddha, what are the highest blessings? So that's the contrast to this particular Sutta. And in this Parabhava Sutta, the Buddha talks about 12 actions or qualities that are the cause of a person's downfall. So Parabhava translates as downfall. It could also be translated as ruin, degeneration, decline, disgrace, even defeat and destruction. What's really important in this session is that we look at it from a more mundane perspective, a worldly perspective. So we know that in the world there is success and failure. In another session, what we can do is look at the super mundane perspective. So for those who have already entered into spiritual practice, developing the Noble Eightfold Path, we can go a little deeper, but we'll save that for a separate session. When you are declining, you're really declining with greed, hatred and delusion. This is what really brings downfall. And so you don't place any value or benefit in the Buddha's teachings. You're prepared to do unwholesome actions by body, speech and mind and you think that there's no repercussions of that. And so that's what is driving downfall, ruin, degeneration. When we go through this sutta, what's really useful to have in mind is to hold up the mirror to ourselves. Similar to the Anumana Sutta or the Vatupama Sutta, we often say, assume that you have this, assume that you have some wrongdoings, and then you can work with it. So the same thing with this particular sutta. When you hear the teaching of the Buddha, just assume maybe I have certain qualities like this, or maybe I do undertake actions like this. And then really think about the downfall as we discuss it. And if we can do so, then we can see the merit in Buddha's teachings. We can see the value in them. So Buddha teaches the part that is non-greed, non-hatred, non-delusion. It's very different from what is very worldly what the world teaches us is to get more. We're entitled to it. We can do anything in order to gain it. But the Buddha's advice is always to mitigate the danger of having these strong desires towards the world, to actually be more cautious. And in an ultimate sense, what the Buddha's teaching is really about supreme safety, supreme sanctuary, so we don't fall down. We're not reborn into lower realms. We're not reborn into dangerous situations and we don't hurt and harm other living beings. So let's begin by looking at this sutta. As always, take what is useful. The sutta begins with the Devas coming to see the Buddha and they pay respects to him and then they say, we ask Gautama a question about a person in a downfall. We've come to ask the Blessed One, what is the cause of a downfall? And then the Buddha says, one who succeeds is easily known. One who falls down is easily known. One who loves the Dhamma is successful, but one who detests the Dhamma falls down. And then the Devas respond and say, thus we understand this. This is the first case of a downfall. So when the Buddha talks about success and failure, he's talking about success being someone who makes progress, doesn't fall. And one who falls down is someone who's in decline, who doesn't make progress, who inevitably will perish. When it comes to detesting the Dhamma, this is really quite obvious. When you detest the Dhamma, you don't want to hear it. You don't want to talk about it. You want to go as far away from it as possible because it's not your priority. It's not something that you're interested in. And quite often, this is associated with being very immersed in the world, that you prioritize work and activity and worldly affairs. Those are what you think and speak about and where you're priorities lie. And so well, what you're seeking from the world is to gain something, whether it's honor, praise, wealth, all those kinds of things. And you respect worldly knowledge and science and all the different aspects that intrigue you. And so there could be topics like politics, sports, all the different things. The key thing around why this is a downfall is because you don't understand the predicament that we are all in. 
If you love the Dhamma, then you know that the Buddha is correcting our view, trying to show us that we are all subject to birth, old age, sickness and death and the whole mass of suffering. And there's a cycle of rebirth that keeps happening unless you break that cycle, unless you see for yourself that whatever pleasure in the world is really quite fleeting and out of our control. And we can be subject to quite dire circumstances, worse than what we experience as suffering in the human realm. So someone who detests the Dhamma does not see that. They're covered by ignorance and delusion, by greed, hatred and delusion. Without that right view, you naturally detest the Dhamma, not going towards it, not wanting to know, and therefore you're in danger, you're, in, you're not in safety, and so therefore this is the first downfall. When we look at someone who loves the Dhamma versus someone who uh, detests the Dhamma, we can also talk about it in terms of going with the stream or going against the stream. So a person who goes along with the stream, the Buddha says, here someone indulges in sensual pleasures and performs bad deeds. This is called a person who goes along with the stream. And then the person who goes against the stream, this is someone who does not indulge in sensual pleasures or perform bad deeds. Even with pain and dejection, weeping with a tearful face, one lives the complete and purified spiritual life. This is called the person who goes against the stream. So what we see here in very simple terms is that the one that goes along with the stream, so the one that can essentially detest Dhamma for the most part, really that person doesn't know about Kama and rebirth, doesn't believe in Kama and rebirth. And so they're quite prepared to indulge in sensual pleasures for gain, honor and praise. And essentially they don't realize that there is uh, results of bad actions. And so they go along and do all kinds of different bad things things that lead to decline. And so that is really going with the stream. And that is very much what the world is, is like. Most of the world is going along with the stream. So going with greed, hatred and delusion. In contrast to that is the person that goes against the stream. So this person has an understanding of what is the right view, has an understanding that there is come and rebirth. And so knows not to indulge in sensual pleasures, tries their best not to not to crave for sensual pleasures, and also keeps a particular level of, of virtue, so not performing bad deeds through body, speech and mind. So even if it's difficult, even if there's pain and dejection or sadness, even in the face of that, they would attempt to live by at least the five precepts. And so this is the person that goes against the stream. One of the things around detesting Dhamma is that you don't see the value or benefit of it. And that pretty much cuts you out of any progress that one can make. So this first particular quality is very, very important. And it's linked to some of these qualities that the Buddha talks about when, it, when he talks about whether one can grow, succeed, make progress and even mature in Dhamma. So when the Buddha talks to the monks, for example, in this Dutya Agarava Sutta, he actually talks about five different qualities. And these qualities, they run through the Parabhava Sutta as well, although some of them are not explicitly spoken about, but you can see underlying to it that these qualities are missing. So, for example, the first one is devoid of conviction. So the Sadda, you have no conviction towards Buddha Dhamma Sangha, and in particular the Buddha, because if you did, if you had a love for Dhamma, then you would heed his words. You would see that there's something of, of great value, a treasure there. The second one is morally shameless. So you have no shame over doing you know, nefarious things or bad things or unwholesome things, and therefore you just go for it. A greedy person very much does not have any shame. That's what is driving the greed path. Likewise, when it comes to the hate path, when you have no fear of wrongdoing, you think it's okay to do quite bad and unwholesome things. And then the other part of it is being lazy and being unwise. So not a lot of people actually admit to being any of these things, but it's really good to, when you think about whether you uh, love or detest Dhamma, all of us have the capacity to detest Dhamma at times, some more so than others, but even those that practice the spiritual path, the Noble Eightfold Path, there are also times where we turn away from Dhamma. 
And this turning away can often be around being more interested in raising other dhammas. Anything else from investments to gains in the world to sciences to any other thing. And at that point, we forget about the dhamma. And so it's very important to look at it from multiple perspectives to actually see where at times we may devalue the dhamma. And at that point, we start to decline. A lot of the things that follow on from this first downfall start because of this rejection of dhamma. The devas then asked the Buddha, tell us the second blessed one, what is the cause of a downfall? And the Buddha replies, the bad are dear to him, he does not treat the good as dear, he approves of the teaching of the bad, that is a cause of a downfall. And then the devas say, thus we understand this, this is the second case of a downfall. If you remember from the Thayodhamma Sutta, so this was about the group of threes, we saw that if one is morally shameless, has no fear of wrongdoing, and is negligent, then you veer towards the wrong kinds of friends, the wrong kinds of company. So in the first instance, when you detest the Dhamma, there is a certain level of negligence, a certain level of mental rigidity, a certain level of covetousness and greed that pervades such a person. There's also a lot of arrogance and conceit around that you know best, particularly you know best about the wrong kind of views about the world. You, you think that your view supersedes what the Buddha is actually saying. Or maybe you just don't know what the Buddha is saying. So there's a certain amount of vanity, conceit, arrogance, all those kinds of defilements that say, I know best, stay away from me. So when it comes to who you surround yourself with, you pretty much surround yourself with people who are of the same nature, the nature to detest Dhamma, inclined towards worldly pleasures and not seeing the danger in those sensual pleasures. And so you associate with the media, with social media, through groups and, and certain programming on the television, with politics, with science, with business, with all the kinds of views that are very worldly views and essentially wrong views and wrong company. And so those are the things that influence you and those are the things that you also endorse. And by nature of that, it includes all the bad things through body, speech and mind because you don't see that there are repercussions for indulging and, and behaving in that way. And there's nothing to prevent you at that point through shame or fear of wrongdoing to protect you in the world. Bad friends are essentially a drain on, on wealth. So this is why it is a downfall. And because you approve of the teaching of the bad, whether it's a formal teaching or whether it's just simply being around the wrong company, any teaching that is really not in concurrence with the Buddha's teaching is, is actually to one's downfall because the Buddha is fully enlightened and sees the bigger picture. So when it comes to this particular downfall, many of us have the opportunity to demonstrate this. Particularly when we veer off the Dhamma path, we start to go with our friends talking about things which are not Dhamma related. Because if you love Dhamma, what the Buddha says is, you speak Dhamma, you practice it, and you think about it, you contemplate it. You are taking it as the priority in the life because you know that that is where the safety is. Whereas when you don't see it that way, you go with the bad then what you're doing is you're going with everything that is out in the world. You follow celebrities, you follow the politics, you follow the wars, you follow the people that are talking nonsense and worse, worse things and doing worse things. So when it comes to good people, as the Buddha is saying, you don't treat the good as dear. In actual fact, what you would potentially do is scorn them and bully them and, and think that they're foolish. And so you're basically insulting the people that are wholesome, that have purity, who are not fo following the stream. So this is very much the, the downfall, particularly when it comes to the fact that when there are noble beings, beings who are good, who are leading a very wholesome life, if you associate with the bad, then you never get to hear the wise words whether they're from a disciple of the Buddha or the Buddha himself in terms of his teachings or associate with people that are going to correct your behavior, going to help you to go to safety. And so this is really the second downfall that 
you're really shooting yourself in the foot by not associating with the right people and at worst you're not treating the good ones allowing them to come close to you uh, treating them well in the single or vada sutta the buddha actually lists out the six drawbacks of bad friends and he says you become friends and companions with those who are addicts carousers drunkards frauds swindlers and thugs these are the six drawbacks of bad friends so many of us we don't think that we associate with these kinds of people but in the workplace there are people like that in the community there are people like that even on television social media all over the place there are people who are who are bad companions even if we don't physically associate but we virtually associate then this is where they start to influence and i think this is something that each of us can look at in terms of where we go down not only that, when it comes to who we look up to, particularly as our role models, one of the reasons why we look at role models from the time of the Buddha is because they are quite exemplary in their conduct and also in what their stories tell us, how they overcome some of the challenges in samsara. So when it comes to how we select friends, who we associate with, who we endorse, who we look up to, it's very important that we're not looking up to the wrong kind of people, people that lie, cheat, steal, kill, and, and, and more. And if those are the types of people that are influencing us, then quite rightly, we would go down the same way that these friends are going down. Because in all likelihood, if you're an addict, carouser, drunk, fraud, swindler, and thug, and this goes for a lot of people that are out in the world today, when you are imbued with greed, hatred, and delusion, what can you expect? You would be one of these types of people because you're driven by that and so when you are associating with people like that you are pulled in whether you like it or not and so those qualities that they are demonstrating start to become the same way that you go so if they speak in a particular way over time you inevitably start to speak in the same way so it's very good to either be alone or to find wiser company good friends and the Buddha goes on to say, particularly around not associating with certain people of bad character, the Buddha says, and what kind of person because is to be looked upon with disgust, not to be associated with, followed and served. Here some person is immoral, of bad character, impure, of suspect behavior, secretive in his actions, not an ascetic though claiming to be one, not a celibate though claiming to be one, inwardly rotten, corrupt and depraved. Such a person is to be looked upon with disgust, not to be associated with, followed and served. For what reason? Even though one does not follow the example of such a person, a bad report still circulates about oneself. He has bad friends, bad companions, bad comrades. Just as a snake that has passed through feces, though it does not bite one, would smear one, so too, though one does not follow the example of such a person, a bad report still circulates about oneself. He has bad friends, bad companions, and bad comrades. Therefore, such a person is to be looked upon with disgust, not to be associated with, followed, and served. And I think that's the thing that we discount quite a lot, that we think even if we go and associate with certain people, if we're seen in the company of such a person, even though they're not our role model, even though we don't follow what they do, the perception is there. And that perception could bring our downfall because people think, oh, you're like them. You're, you know, a squanderer, a, a drunk, a, a person who has bad qualities. You're immoral, impure. And, and largely that idea that birds of a feather flock together, most people perceive that. If you're hanging around with the wrong types of company, you're endorsing it. They perceive that you're endorsing it and they perceive that maybe you're the same as well. And so if you want to be respected in the community, if you want to be respected in the business place, if you want to be respected in your family, then it's very good not to associate with this type of person, the moral person, the bad character, even someone who's suspected of nefarious or terrible things. So it's something also to bear in mind because this can very much bring, bring downfall. The devas then asked the Buddha, tell us the third blessed one, what is the cause of a downfall? And the Buddha says, 
If a person is lethargic, gregarious, and does not make an exertion, indolent, one who displays anger, this is the cause of a downfall. And the devas reply, thus we understand this, this is the third case of a downfall. So the Buddha here is referring to a person who's lethargic. So this is someone who's drowsy or sleepy, gregarious or sociable, and then does not make an exertion. So someone's inactive and doesn't really want to get up. And then also indolence, idleness, laziness, slothfulness, being languid. And then you display or show signs of anger. So when you look at this and you think about the second downfall being wanting to associate with bad friends and endorsing bad teachings and not finding the good kind of company. Well, in the Tayodama Sutta, if you remember, having bad friends leads to indolence. So you become very deluded. There's a lot of moha. And the mind becomes quite inclined to the sloth and torpor, the dhinamitta. You basically become imprisoned because you don't even hear the dhamma. So you pleasure seek and then what happens is you go into a very dull mind state. And you're quite happy to go into that dull mind state or sleepiness or anything to overcome the dukkha. So rather than brighten the mind to, to find out what is the root cause of dukkha, what you rather do is go and sit in front of the telly, uh, veg out, lounge about, and, and or socialize with friends who are doing the same, who do certain things that is not really going to help you in the long run. And so what happens is you end up tolerating unwholesome or bad actions. You allow important things to slip. So you procrastinate and you make excuses for a lot of things. So indolence really leads to a lot of laziness where you, you can't be bothered to do very many things. So when you look at this, you look at other suttas like Parihana Sutta that we studied before, this is something where you delight in sleep, you take delight in sleep, you're devoted to sleep. Buddha always says this is someone who'll never attain Nibbana. And we know other stories of King Pasanadi of Kosala where the Buddha is saying to him, if you're drowsy or torpid, you eat too much and you sleep, you're pretty much like a fattened hog. You, you feed on the fodder and basically you keep coming back again and again into birth. So all of these things, when you look at these particular qualities, these are the qualities that lead to draining your wealth, not being able to sustain a means of supporting yourself if you have these types of qualities. And if you get angry, what happens is this kind of quality comes when you're, when you're being accused, when someone is pulling you up, when someone is encouraging you to make effort and you get angry. So with this kind of overall behavior, it leads to downfall and it also leads to people feeling that they can't rely upon you, that it's very different when you're successful, you, you, you're more active, you have this sense of purpose and you don't display anger so easily and you definitely don't show so, much, so many signs of, of indolence or laziness. So when you look at, say, for example, the result of being angry, well, the karmic result of that is to be born with ugliness. So if one comes back into the human realm. So when we look at an example of this, you know, we can all be like this. We can all go through periods of not being bothered with things, having that kind of attitude. We can't be bothered with housework. We can't be bothered to go to work. When we're at work, we, we just feel really lazy. The, the mind doesn't want to, to activate, doesn't really want to fulfill, you know, obligations and things. Would rather just watch TV, indulge in snacks and do other things which are the cause of downfall. And so when you're young, if you create these kinds of habit tendencies and you know when you're young, it's quite easy to, to just go lie on the couch or sleep in late and, and indulge in certain things uh, late into the night, bad habits, then what you see is it's difficult to study, difficult to work, difficult to succeed, even in sports even in certain other areas of, of one's capacity. So if you take that into grown-up life, then that is a cause for downfall because if you can't study and you can't do even a little bit of work around the house or a part-time job, when you have these kinds of tendencies when you're young, then when you're old, it, it gets worse. You can be fired from your job, you can be reprimanded, you can be given a reputation for being a lazy person or one who displays anger quite easily or just someone who's more interested in socializing or, or things of that nature. So 
These are the things that bring downfall. If we refer to the single of Adha Sutta, what we find is the Buddha talks about the six drawbacks of laziness. So the Buddha says that you don't get your work done because you think it's too cold, it's too hot, it's too late, it's too early, I'm too hungry, I'm too full. And then when you dwell on so many excuses for not working, you don't make any money and the money you already have runs out. So these are the six drawbacks of habitual laziness. The Devas then asked the Buddha about the fourth downfall. Tell us the fourth blessed one, what is the cause of a downfall? And the Buddha says, if one who is able does not support his mother or his father, when they have grown old, their youth gone, that is a cause of a downfall. And the Devas say, thus we understand this, this is the fourth case of a downfall. So in very simple terms, this is when you don't want to support your parents, even though you have the means to. So you don't want to take care of them, you don't want to serve them, you don't want to help them out. So it's very easy for us to see that when you're ungrateful, you're unthankful towards parents, then you demonstrate this lack of integrity. You forget that these are the people that have given you this precious human birth, that they are also your first teachers, and that they have unconditionally taken care of you when you couldn't support yourself, so when you're still dependent on them and much, much more in, in some cases. So there is no honoring of parents when you don't wish to support them. And in that way, you can't really repay them for the debt that you have made with them by them giving you this precious human life. Inevitably, people will blame you, they'll shun you, they won't praise you. The wise people will not praise someone who do doesn't take care of their parents. And so you can really expect a bad destination when, when this is the case. Now. The other way of thinking about it is if you have children and they see you demonstrating this kind of behavior towards your parents, then can you really expect your children to support you in old age? So this is something where your example is lacking. Now in the Singhala Vada Sutta, the Buddha says, a child should serve their parents thinking, I will support those who supported me. I'll do my duty to them. I'll maintain the family traditions. I'll take care of the inheritance. When they pass away, I'll make offering on their behalf. And then parents show their children compassion by keeping them from doing bad things, supporting them in doing the good, training them in a profession and connecting them with a suitable partner and then transferring inheritance in due time. So that's the relationship that the Buddha promotes. When you look at the defilements which are driving the lack of support, the lack of care, it's stinginess at the forefront, but then it's also conceit and arrogance. It's vanity, mental rigidity, negligence. These are the things that are pushing one towards this unthankful, ungrateful behavior. So the way that we can demonstrate this, there's multiple ways. So we can belittle needing to care and support our parents. We can justify it by saying, oh, they can still take care of themselves. Or when we offer support, it can be conditional. We could say, I'll only give this much or I'll only do this much. It will be my way. So there's lots of limits that we place on how we support our parents. Or we might turn away from them completely, thinking that they're a bother to us. We don't want to look after them. Another way could be that we expect them to still give us things, even though we earn more than them, even though we are doing quite well. But we still expect them to be giving us money or, or giving us certain things. Or we're waiting for the inheritance without having done much. And at worst, it could be that there is elderly abuse, that we, we actually do quite not so nice things when it comes to, to our parents, like tell them off or hurt them in, in various different ways, knowingly and unknowingly. What's interesting is that Saka, king of the Devas, one of the vows that he took in order to become Saka was he undertook to support his parents. And so he's a very good example when it comes to if you want to succeed rather than decline, it's to really look after your parents. When we recently looked at the Mahasupina Jataka and one of the terrifying dreams of King Pasanathya Kosala was these cows who were suckling on their young calves. And the Buddha explained that the dream was to come in the future when age is no longer respected that in that future time, young people won't have regard for their parents or their parents-in-law. They'll handle the family estate themselves 
And if it pleases them, they'll give food and clothing to the old folks. But if it doesn't suit them, they will withhold their gifts. And so the old people, destitute and dependent, will survive only by the favour and whim of their own children. So this is when it gets quite bad, where it's not just simply supporting parents when you're able to, but it's going that much further. So that is very much in decline. So when you look at that and you think about the world is declining in this respect, and you, you already see certain signs of this, you see signs of elderly abuse, neglect, disrespect, all kinds of things of that nature. But if you see it heading that direction, this is something that is not praised by the Buddha. And so if there is any quality like that in us, then we need to turn that around because otherwise we inherently dec decline. It is not a very good result for us if we don't take care of our parents. So as we were saying about Saka King of the Devas, there's this sutta called the Vatapata Sutta. And it says that in the past, when Saka King of the Devas was a human being, he adopted and undertook seven vows by undertaking of which he achieved the status of Saka. So when a person supports his parents and respects the family elders, when his speech is gentle, courteous, and he refrains from divisive words, when he strives to remove meanness, is truthful and vanquishes anger, the Tavatin Sadevas call him a truly superior person. So this is the thing as well. There are other people in the time of the Buddha who were also uh, very much like that. One of the people from the Kasapa Buddha times is Gatikara. He was another example. He didn't ordain, although he was already a non-returner, he didn't ordain so that he could care for his blind and old parents. And he was also an excellent and trusted lay disciple of the Buddha. So these are the examples that one would want to follow rather than being mean or belittling or, or not taking care of parents. The devas then ask, tell us the fifth blessed one, what is the cause of a downfall? Then the Buddha says, if one deceives with false speech, a Brahmin or an ascetic or some other mendicant, that is a cause of a downfall. And then the devas say, thus we understand this, this is the fifth case of a downfall. So this is essentially about lying and cheating or lying and deceiving. So the wise people do not praise someone who lies, who has false speech. And we know that the result of false speech or lies is being falsely accused if you are reborn into the human realm. But you can expect worse if you are reborn into lower realms. So with this, this is really where you offer to supply something. You make an offering and you say, what, what do you need? And this person who leads a spiritual life, who keeps moral precepts, says to you, I need this, and it's this kind of thing. And what happens is you may not fulfill that obligation. You go back on your word, or you give something that they didn't want instead. So in that way, you lie and cheat. Now, you can acquire a bad reputation if this is the thing that you frequently do. You can also be blamed for not fulfilling obligations by lying and deception. Or sometimes what drives you is gain, honor and praise that you try and fulfill these things, but your objective is actually something else. So this could be because of your business needs or your political needs, whatever the case may be. You may even pretend to have higher virtue than you really have in order to, to gain something from people who are leading the spiritual life. So it's very good to be quite cautious because there are karmic results when you don't fulfill certain obligations, when you lie and cheat, particularly to people that are keeping higher virtue. So people eventually will find out. So if you are being hypocritical, that you are holding yourself out to have you know, higher morals than you really have, people eventually find out. People will talk about you in a not so nice way. And when they see deception or corruption and lies in, in how you have dealings with, with good people, then what happens is you could lose wealth because you could lose work. You could lose not just existing work, but also future work. And it's not a good thing, as we know, to lie, deceive, cheat uh, people that have higher virtue. 
and eventually the people around you will, will shun you. So a lot of the defilements that one breeds when you're, you're in this particular downfall is hypocrisy, fraud or deception, having stinginess around reputation, having stinginess in fulfilling uh, what you give. And of course, when you lie, as in harness false speech, then you, you inevitably break precepts. And then the devas say to the Buddha, tell us the sixth blessed one, what is the cause of a downfall? And the Buddha says, if a person with abundant wealth, endowed with bullion and food, eats delicacies alone, this is a cause of a downfall. And the devas say, thus we understand this, this is the sixth case of a downfall. So here the Buddha is saying that a person is wealthy and they end up eating alone. Clearly there is certain things that the Buddha is highlighting, such as stinginess or selfishness, not wanting to share and also having greed towards food. And maybe at certain times even hypocrisy, pretending that you don't have a certain amount of wealth, but secretively you eat alone and you eat all the lavish kinds of things. So one of the suttas is called the Adiya Sutta, and the Buddha talks about how you utilize wealth. That if you don't utilize wealth properly, that you don't share it towards parents, your partner, children, workers, friends and companions, you don't make provisions for future losses. You don't make offerings to relatives, guests, ancestors, kings, deities, and offerings of alms. Then you have regrets. So this is one of the areas where maybe you're wealthy and you, you don't take out your family members who are not so wealthy out for meals. You don't bring food around to your parents. You might eat in secret all the lavish things all the really nice food and you only share what is very ordinary. Maybe you're wealthy in business and you don't take out your employees for a lunch or a celebratory meal, those sorts of things. So inevitably what happens is people will blame you, they will shun you, they won't respect you. And in some cases they'll openly say that you're stingy. So this is one of the fundamental qualities when it comes to walking the path is giving and generosity. When you talk about how you begin the path, the Noble Eightfold Path, it really begins in the, in the first instance with being able to give. Because when you're able to give, it means you're willing to give up, renunciate. So during hard times, people will remember that you're a stingy person. So when you experience downfall, when you lose your wealth, people will remember, maybe I wouldn't help him first. Maybe this person is getting a serve for their stinginess. And so even people who work for you, they don't extend themselves beyond what is needed. So they won't go the extra mile. They won't work late unless they're paid for it. So they end up despising you for your stinginess. And of course, deities like the devas, they, they don't praise or protect people who are stingy. They actually see the, the benefit of someone who is generous, who is open-hearted with what they have. Now, when it comes to Sapurisadana Sutta, the Buddha goes further by saying, someone who is stingy, their children, wives, employees, workers and staff, they won't want to listen to a person who, who doesn't share. They won't pay attention to them and they won't try to understand them. So there, nothing good comes of being stingy. And in this case, it refers to food, but it can extend to other areas as well. And the Buddha often, when you look at the stories at the time of the Buddha, those who are wealthy, who don't share, they usually end up in a lower destination unless they have done something significantly good that counteracts that kind of, of behavior. The devas then asked the Buddha, tell us the seventh blessed one, what is the cause of a downfall? And the Buddha says, a person proud because of social class, proud because of wealth, proud because of clan, looks down on his own relative, that is a cause of a downfall. And the devas say, thus we understand this, this is the seventh case of a downfall. So when you're proud, you're quite stubborn and conceited around certain things. So in this case, it's because of social class, so your birth, and then you're proud because of your wealth, 
and then proud because of your clan. So in reference to clan, this, this could be your ancestry, your lineage, your family ties. And therefore you look down or despise, neglect your relatives. Now, this is really the case where you forget who has helped you to get where you are. So whether it's your parents, your friends, your colleagues, your partner, and you end up belittling, despising those people that have helped you. This is literally what they mean by biting the hand that has fed you. So the people, when you end up belittling them, inevitably, they can't help but curse you, wish you to fail or fall from whatever you're standing on. Now, this is, of course, a very worldly yardstick and Dhamma doesn't evaluate on the lines of social class, wealth or clan. Dhamma is really around whether you do good deeds or bad deeds, whether you penetrate the right view. So it's not driven by all these different ways of uh, carving up status. So some of these things is very much driven by ignorance and a bad destination is to be expected. And it's quite shameful really when you want people to respect you for these sorts of things. Now, what's really quite ironic is the Buddha says that the result of being you know, prideful or obstinate and also arrogant in relation to any of these things is that one can expect a low birth or being born to a low class family if you're re reborn into a human realm. Now, if you're not born to a human realm, you can also expect a, a much worse destination being reborn into lower realms. So it's quite ironic, really, that when you're quite proud of these particular things, the result is actually you don't get that. Now, an example of how we do this is, say you're born into a family and you're the only person to go to college. The rest of your family members are so-called so uneducated. And you come back from college and you look down on, on all your family members who haven't managed to get a college edu education. Or you become wealthy and it's so-called independently wealthy. And so you look back at your family and you neglect them and you despise them because they're still poor. They haven't been as successful as you. Or you study and then you eventually live abroad and you return to your home country. And because you've picked up different ways of living, different culture, different ideas, you look down at the simplicity or the different ways that your family is still living. Or it could be the case where you're a commoner and you marry into royalty. And then you look back at your relatives and you, you think of them as being low class, even though that you came from that particular upbringing. So there are different ways that one can look at this, you know, th these worldly ways of looking at it. Even when someone thinks that they're pure born and they look at someone who's mixed race and they look down on them. So there's various different examples where we can go down because of this. Our failing is that we become very prideful. We have a lot of vanity. We derogate people in our minds and we also say them out. And there's a particular stinginess that comes, vannamacharya, so stinginess over reputation. You think that you're better than other people. In Pali, there's also this thing in the Anumana Sutta, Atukansaka uh, Paravambi, where you glorify yourself and you demean others. So it's a very horrible quality really you end up being quite arrogant so the downfall is really not not good the devas then asked the buddha tell us the eighth blessed one what is the cause of a downfall and the buddha says a womanizer one fond of liquor addicted to gambling dissipates whatever he has gained that is a cause of a downfall and the devas say thus we understand this this is the eighth case of a downfall so when you think about dissipating of wealth, dissipating of whatever you have gained, so if you work very hard and then you have these particular tendencies to womanize, to uh, go towards alcohol, to, to gamble, then what you can expect is ruin, you know, to destroy what you've gained, to spoil it. So Digajanu Sutta talks about four drains on wealth and these three are included in that four. And the fourth one is having bad friends, companions and associates. 
And the simile that the Buddha gives is, suppose there was a large reservoir with four inlets and four drains, and someone was to open up the drains and close off the inlets, and the heavens don't provide enough rain. You'd expect that large reservoir to dwindle, not expand. In the same way, there are four drains on wealth that has been gathered in this way, womanizing, drinking, gambling, and having bad friends, companions, and associates. So this one's a pretty straightforward one because you end up just spending, 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 and you end up going down with all the bad kind of friends who want to do the same things. What's even worse than that is that these three things often lead to more misconduct. So misconduct through body, speech and mind. The tongue gets very loose when you indulge in liquor. When you're addicted to gambling, you're prone to get quite angry when you lose. Womanizing can often lead to sexual misconduct, lying, cheating, all kinds of things. So inevitably, you end up causing more harm and hurt to those around you than just the simple act of womanizing, being fond of alcohol and being addicted to gambling. Now, in particular to the drinking of alcohol, the Buddha says that the result of uh, drinking alcohol and why it is to be avoided is because if you're reborn, what you can expect is mental derangement or madness. That's if you're reborn into a human realm, but at worst, it's being born into lower realms. So people don't have a tendency to trust if you have these kinds of traits. They look at you with a propensity towards addiction. So definitely with womanizing, liquor and gambling, if you're fond of alcohol, you could be an alcoholic. If you're addicted to gambling, same sort of thing. So when people look at you, they look at you and they see all these vices and they think, hmm, this person is driven more by that than any other quality that is going to help them be successful at work, in business or in other aspects of life. So when it comes to womanizing, inevitably what happens is you end up spending, spending to go out to eat, to have entertainment, spending for gifts. And if you go from one woman to another woman, then the spending just gets out of control. Now, this can also apply to women who go after men as well. And women have also been known to pay for a lot of things and lose a lot of money because of, I guess the word is not womanizing, but the opposite of whatever that word would be. Now, when it comes to drinking, we all know that that incurs a great expense. Alcohol is not a cheap kind of expenditure. When you buy things at the supermarket, that's one expense. But when you go out to drink, that gets more and more expensive, depending on where you go. So when it comes to going to a pub, that's one expense. If you go to a nightclub, it gets more expensive. If you go to places up to five star hotels, then the alcohol gets more and more expensive. Eventually, you end up discarding all your wealth. And the same with gambling, but to a greater extent, there are certain things that we'll go through that the Buddha talks about, the drawbacks of both drinking and also gambling. There are also many stories. If you look in the newspaper, there are always stories that talk about the downfalls of people that have gone this way. So you see celebrities who are womanizers and what happens is they lose all their wealth because they've had children with a variety of different women. And so they lose all their wealth to child support or they lose their wealth if they're fond of liquor to paying for everybody's drinks and having lots of parties and lots of trips to places to indulge in alcohol or where they're addicted to gambling. They, they end up just being totally addicted, expecting the win and they end up losing all their money. So this is a way of, of seeing that it's a huge drain on one's finances. And really, when, when you think about it, this is tendencies that are very, very harmful. The Buddha talks about the six drawbacks of drinking alcohol in the single of Adha Sutta. And the first one is immediate loss of wealth. So this is something that we've already spoken about. It's very expensive to, to drink alcohol. The second is promotion of quarrels. So if you've been for a night out to a pub or a nightclub, quite often you see people arguing. The mind is already into a very dull state and it's not protected. And so you're quite often prone to argue, to get angry at the slightest thing. And quite often you also see physical altercations where people are getting into punch-ups and fights over very little things. The third one is susceptibility to illness. So we all know that 
If you indulge in alcohol, it plays havoc with one's health. It can be quite dire in terms of alcoholic poisoning, or it can even be quite bad in terms of one's organs. And definitely it affects the mind. The fourth is disrepute. So someone who is prone to alcohol, who's known as a drunk or someone who's an addict, they don't have a good reputation. They're known for being susceptible to a weakened state because of dependency on alcohol. The fifth is indecent exposure. With indecent exposure, it really comes down to losing your inhibitions and then the clothes just tend to come off. This is not necessarily a good thing. People frown upon that. And then when it comes to weakened wisdom, I think this is really where people don't recognize. It's very hard to build the mind up to be able to cognize certain things. If you indulge in alcohol, you're going quite far away from being able to concentrate the mind, develop the mind, develop wisdom because you've muddled it. You've actually damaged the mind. And so these are the things that one needs to think about, particularly when you're young, so you don't start to indulge. The Buddha puts this as one of the precepts not to indulge in intoxicants for this very reason. It's something that lowers inhibitions and creates more havoc in one's life and a tendency to go down the unwholesome path, to break precepts, further precepts through body, speech and mind, and to inhibit the mind from being able to lift itself out of greed, hatred and delusion. And in the single of Artha Sutta, the Buddha also talks about six drawbacks of gambling. So the first is victory breeds enmity. The second is the loser mourns their money. Thirdly, there is immediate loss of wealth. Fourth, a gambler's word carries no weight in public assembly. Fifth, uh, friends and colleagues treat them with contempt. And sixth, no one wants to marry a gambler for they think this individual is a gambler. They're not able to support a partner. I think the main thing with a gambler is the addiction part of it, the tendency not to be able to hold on to money and not to be responsible around money. And when it comes to the loss of money, you would keep borrowing more. Very similar to a drug addict wanting to get that shot, get that pleasure seeking moment when you, when you win, when you're gambling and to avoid the losses. And so very much this is not something that is uh, seen favorably. The devas then asked the Buddha, tell us the ninth blessed one, what is the cause of a downfall? And the Buddha says, one who is not content with his own wives is seen among prostitutes, seen among the wives of others. That is the cause of a downfall. And the devas say, thus we understand this. This is the ninth case of a downfall. So in this case, one is not content, one is not happy, not pleased with one's own partner. So the wise don't praise adultery because this is really what it is, is cheating and adultery and sexual misconduct. So the bad result that can be expected if you're reborn into a human birth is enmity and rivalry in a future life. So clearly this is not something that is praised in modern society, although it's very prevalent. So one of the things could be that your friends encourage this kind of behavior. Maybe it's a sign of power, prestige, ability to, to do these terrible things. It's also something that uh, you feel empowered yourself by doing it in the wrong way. When you do this, particularly if you spend on prostitutes, the wealth drains, if you go after other people's wives, it also incurs a lot of deception a lot of lying and cheating, deceiving. And the worries that come is if you are caught, if you are punished, particularly if you're cheating with other people's partners. So there is a certain drain on, on one's finances, but also when it comes to consorting with prostitutes, there is a risk with that. There's a risk that they can steal from you. There's a risk that they can blackmail you. There's a risk that you can catch a disease from them and more, there's more risks. And if you are into pornography and exchanging things over the internet, then you can be blackmailed by a third party if they find out pictures or, or other things or video. So there are certain things that can be quite detrimental because when these things are exposed, you get a bad reputation, 
you don't just drain the wealth, but if people find out, they don't trust you, they don't have confidence in you. Despite it being quite prevalent in society to go to prostitutes and, and to take mistresses and, and to cheat on, on your partner, it's not actually something that is part of moral society. People will have no confidence in you. You hurt your partner, your children, your family, even your business. You can lose friends, you can lose colleagues, you can lose your family. And so this is a great downfall, even though in some circles it is seen as something that uh, is attributed to power and, and certain kind of prestige. But really, when you look at it from the lens of a moral society, it's not something that is very, very good. And so you end up breaking the precept, definitely, which is sexual misconduct. But there's also other mental defilements that come. Vanity, conceit, arrogance, maybe even competition, things like that. There's one particular sutta that we can look at. This is the Niraya Sutta. And in this sutta, the Buddha talks about four qualities where one is cast into hell as if brought there. And the four qualities are you kill living beings, you take what is not given, you engage in sexual misconduct, and you speak falsely. So anyone who possesses these four qualities is cast into hell as if brought there. And so the Buddha ends by saying, killing living beings, taking what is not given, the uttering of false speech, and consorting with others' wives. The wives do not praise such deeds. The Devas then asked the Buddha, tell us the tenth, blessed one, what is the cause of a downfall? And the Buddha says, when a man past his youth marries a girl with budding breath, he does not sleep from jealousy or envy over her. That is a cause of a downfall. Then the Devas say, thus we understand this, this is the tenth case of a downfall. So a man past their youth, usually this is someone who is well past their youth, and they marry someone young, and they get very jealous, and therefore they can't sleep. So despite attracting and marrying a young person, what they do is they really envy their youth. As one ages, it gets more difficult to accept aging. And so there's a fear that they have married you because of your money, your power, your status, and maybe a certain part of you understands that. But what you worry about is that they may cheat on you, that they may go for someone younger, someone more wealthy and powerful. And therefore, the reason why you can't sleep is because you worry about it. When you worry about it and you don't sleep, it may affect your wealth, your business, and so further downfall can be expected. And you may end up spending more on your young wife or partner because at an old age, you, you, you think that you need to incur more expenses to keep them. And they may not have the qualities of someone who is more mature. And so they may be quite frivolous or spendthrift. And in a divorce, they may take you to the cleaners. There could be social pressure that comes when you see friends trading in their older wives for a younger version, you know, what you call a trophy wife or a trophy husband. And it may be a sign of that you've still got it, that you're still able to attract someone young, beautiful or handsome. You've still got what it takes. It gives you a, a boost to your ego, but it can come at great expense, great downfall. In certain circles, people laugh at behind someone's back the fact that they've taken an extremely young wife and maybe the other aspect is people see it as a re rejection of, of getting old that they see that this person is fearful of getting old and and for a time they're able to keep up with their young bride or young groom but at some point the age really does show up and so in certain circumstances, you see the young person that has married the older person, they leave. They leave for someone younger. And so your, your worst kind of nightmare comes true. That what you were worrying about, that they would leave you for someone younger or cheat on you with someone younger, it, it comes true. And so you're left feeling quite desperate, feeling so much despair over you know, your choices. So what drives this in terms of the defilement is really vanity and intoxication with youth, sensual desire, envy. So what's really interesting about what the Buddha says about envy and being resentful 
is that the bad result the, in the Chula Kama Vibhanga Sutta, the Buddha says, if you're reborn into a human realm, the result is having no influence, no significance. So that's quite an interesting one to contemplate. The other thing that may come from this is also if you have children from an earlier marriage or something, they end up despising you for the choices that you make. And so you may lose relationships over these kinds of choices. And you might inspire fights because of fights over inheritance, fights over time, fights over, over money. So there are many other things that, that come with this. The devas then asked the Buddha, tell us the 11th blessed one, what is the cause of a downfall? And the Buddha says, if one places in authority a debauched woman, a spendthrift, or a man of similar nature, that is a cause of a downfall. And then the devas say, thus we understand this, this is the 11th case of a downfall. So this is essentially putting somebody who may be addicted to alcohol or fine things, or someone who squanders money, into the position of authority, someone who is in charge of finances or in charge of a business. So when this is the case, what happens is failure comes quite quickly because the wealth gets depleted or the business goes bust. When you appoint someone who has these not so good tendencies, then this is a foolish thing to do. You end up losing everything. So the examples are you put at the head of the family who dictates how you spend money, how you save money. It's a person who's a drunk or a squanderer. Then what happens is they'll dissipate or spend all the money. They'll mismanage the money. In wealthy families, you often speak of someone who builds up all the wealth, like an ancestor who was very successful at business and built up great wealth. And then only for the next generation or the one after, to lose it all. You know, if you put in someone who mismanages, who has no sense, who has very terrible addictions, then what happens is it all drains away. Or in the case of your business, you put in charge, maybe in the case of a young wife, someone who doesn't have any business now, who likes the finer things in life. Then what happens is if you put someone who is not the right person to be there, then their addictions and, and certain qualities, you can expect your business to decline. If we look at the Kula Sutta, this is Anguttara chapter 4, discourse number 258, the Buddha talks about why a family cannot hold on to its great wealth. And the Buddha says, in every case where a family cannot hold on to its great wealth for long, it is for one or another of these four reasons. Which four? One, they don't look for things that are lost. Two, they don't repair things that have gotten old. Three, they are immoderate in consuming food and drink. Four, they place a woman or man of no virtue or principles in the position of authority. In every case where a family cannot hold on to its great wealth for long, it is for one or another of these four reasons. So when you look at the fourth one, that you put someone in authority who has no virtue or principles, this applies to when you put someone in place who has unfavorable tendencies. So someone who is addicted to alcohol or gambling or those sorts of things, or someone who is a squanderer, who doesn't lack the principles of being responsible towards a family family belongings, family wealth. The devas asked the Buddha, tell us the 12th blessed one, what is the cause of a downfall? And so the final one that the Buddha says is, if one of little wealth and strong craving is born into a ruling elite family, he aspires to rulership here, that is a cause of a downfall. So here we're talking about someone who's born into an elite family. But they may be of little wealth, but their craving for power and wealth is very strong. That's why they aspire to be a ruler. So if we go to the Kathya Sutta, if you remember this Sutta, it talked about a Brahmin who asked the Buddha about the wish, the quest, the determination, the inclination, and the final goal of ruling elite families. And in this Sutta, they also asked about thieves and 
householders and women and, and summoners as well. But in relation to Kathias, which is really the ruling elite, what the Buddha said was wealth is the wish for the ruling elite. Their quest is for wisdom, their determination or resolution is for power, and their inclination is for territory or land. And their final goal is supremacy or sovereignty. So when you look at this, someone may lack wealth, so they haven't accumulated enough wealth or a means for support, but they have very strong craving for wealth and power. And sometimes this comes because you have some sort of pride based on being born into that kind of elite family. So elite families can come from villages and from poverty, but because of their birth or their ancestry, it gives them a certain status or, or so-called influence. And what happens is they wrongly think that wealth and power is their birthright, that they desire something that maybe is meant for someone else, someone who is more deserving or, or entitled. So through history, you see people who grab for power and wealth, you know, through land and other means, and their sons and their daughters follow suit. You see this in political families. You see it in business families. And so it's a cause for great downfall because of the strong craving for wealth and power, something that may not be your entitlement or something that is deserving. And so when you think about this, because of that strong craving for power and wealth, they would do anything to rule. They would lie, they would cheat, they would steal, they would kill. They would ruin others as a result of fighting to rule. So you break lots and lots of precepts. And as we know, there are results of those. So if you take what has not been given to you, the result, if you're reborn into the human realm, is loss of wealth. If you kill living beings as a, as a means to fighting to get wealth and power, the result is a short lifespan if you're reborn into the human realm. And if you're not reborn into a human realm, you can expect to be born into lower realms. So you see this in politics, you see this in business, people born into elite families with strong aspirations for, for power and, and wealth. You could be born into families where you're the second, third, fourth son or daughter, and so you're not entitled to first place for all the inheritance or the position. And so you, you have the strong craving despite that. And even today, you see people elected to positions because of their birthright but they're not entitled to it. They don't have the necessary qualifications, the wisdom, or even the true intent for the greater well-being of other people. They largely seek power to gain wealth, position, status, and supreme domination over the rest of the, the population. So really, when you look at this last one, the downfall comes because you're willing to break all the precepts, you're happy to breed all the defilements, and you have no understanding of the repercussions of all these actions and you cause great harm to other human beings, other living beings through the choices you make in order to, to get power and wealth and in order to sustain power and wealth. The Buddha concludes the teaching by saying, having examined these cases of downfall in the world, a wise person, noble, endowed with vision, passes on to an auspicious world. So here the Buddha is really saying that when you examine all these 12 different qualities and actions and you see how it leads to downfall, loss of wealth, loss of respect, loss of all the things that are important to you, then with the vision of really seeing with insight what is really happening, you refrain, you make effort towards changing it around. You make effort towards correcting your view. You make effort towards keeping precepts. You make effort towards generosity. You make effort towards not harming your loved ones. You make effort towards caring for your parents. You make effort towards making wise choices around tendencies such as alcohol, gambling, misconduct with the senses, sexual misconduct, all those kinds of decisions which are important and even around taking power and wanting to rule for the wrong reasons. 
even wanting to lead businesses for the wrong reasons, all those different types of things, you really examine these causes of downfall. And then with a sense of urgency, when you really see where the Buddha is, is teaching, what, what he's pointing to, you realize that the sense of urgency is to refrain, to make effort to refrain and to correct. And so in doing so, what the Buddha says is, you attain a much auspicious rebirth. Now, what's more important than that is to really develop path and fruit so that you are more safeguarded because simply being reborn into a better rebirth doesn't safeguard you from the whole mass of suffering. And that's something when you start to really understand the teachings of the Buddha, when you start to really understand that you want to develop the Noble Eightfold Path because that is the way out of suffering that the Buddha talks about, then you really want to know about what is right view, what is right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, what is right effort, what is right mindfulness, and then what is right concentration. But even to this point, this is still good when you start to see how dangerous it is because real safety is when you enter the stream because then you are limiting the number of rebirths coming back. And when that is the case, and you start developing and progressing on the path, then you can have the fruit of stream entry, the fruit of once return, the fruit of non-return, and then arahanship, realize Nibbana, no more suffering, complete safety and security. So at the end of this particular teaching, the devas were very happy, and it is said that they made significant breakthrough in the Dhamma by listening to this particular teaching. So before we end this session, let's just look at this summary slide, which has all 12 different uh, actions that the Buddha has spoken about that brings downfall to a person. It's really good to take some time to go down this list and to really examine where we are still falling short, where we still are bound for downfall. And all of us have something or some things within this list. And this includes people who are already on the spiritual path. So people, some people may not be fond of alcohol. They may already be taking the fifth precept. Some people may not be womanizers or uh, having sexual misconduct, but there are other things here that may also lead to downfall where it is there. And so it's very useful to look at it. If you're young and you're looking at this list, quite often you think when you're young, it's okay if I do this, nobody will ever find out. Even if you're old, some people think, nobody will ever find out, I'm doing this secretively. But the problem is in this modern age of technology, in this modern age of social media, even if you don't share it, somebody else might. And that is there for a very long time. If you try and scrub the internet of things that you didn't want up there, it's very difficult. There are documentaries and, and people that say it's very hard to scrub the internet. It's there for longevity. It's stored somewhere. When you apply for a job, and these days people check, they check people's social media. Has this person done anything wrong? Has this person been involved in bad things? And if they find it, they may ask you about it, or if they find it, they may not even offer you an interview. They don't even want to know you. So anything you write in social media will come up, whether it's on Twitter or whether it's on Instagram, Facebook, what have you. These things now have a way of being found out. And so if you try to hide something, always remember most of these things that lead to a downfall of a person, we try to hide, but inevitably people find out. And even if they don't find out, sometimes a third party finds out and they blackmail you or try to cause great discomfort. And people that are involved in the wrong things with you, they can use it against you. And so this world, although it is in decline, although it is increasingly perverse, there is still people in the world that are quite moral. And you would be very surprised that people that 
lead big businesses who are very successful. We think that they all drink and squander their money and, and gamble and have all these things. But there are many successful people who don't do any of these things. They just don't talk about it. But they are very successful because they refrain. And this is just in everyday modern success and failure. This is not even going into the spiritual side of it. I would recommend that you go through this list because it's very helpful, particularly for lay people, if you want to succeed, if you want to have easeful conditions. Because when it comes to downfall, all it brings is dis-ease. There are more troubles and suffering that comes when you do the wrong things, when you engage in the wrong kind of conduct and you try and hide things and you lie, cheat, steal, and what have you, more trouble comes, more troubling people come around you. We can end our session here. Let's share the merit with all sentient beings. May all beings be happy and well. May all beings be free from suffering. Blessings of the Triple Gem. Wishing you well. Teruan Saranai.